The following program is a presentation of Winchester Academy. Good evening and welcome to the second program of the summer series from Winchester Academy. My name is Bill Steinmetz and I am a trustee of Winchester Academy. Please silence your mobile phones, watch alarms, anything that goes beep. Also, please hold your questions until the end of the presentation. Wait for a microphone to be brought to you so that everyone can hear the questions that you're as asking. We're pleased to be partnering, partnering with the Wapaka Library in their annual Community Read program. This year's book is Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer. It is available for checkout upstairs in the library. A book discussion for Winchester Academy will be held here on Monday evening, July 24th, led by Sue Abrahamson. If you can't make that date, the library has other discussion dates available as well. <coughs> Our next program is in one week, on Monday, June 26th, when Charles Cohen will present Muslims and Jews in Christian America. Due to a slight uh, mix-up, we did not have coffee necessarily ready early, so coffee and uh, cookies will be available later. Cookies are up here. The, uh, cookie, the cookie sponsor tonight is Susan Stud, and tonight's program is sponsored by Dick Hansen. <laughs> Our speaker tonight is John Bates. John is the author. John is the author of ten books and a contributed to seven others all of which focus on the natural history of the North Woods. He's worked as a naturalist in Wisconsin North Woods for 33 years, leading an array of trips and giving talks, all designed to help people further understand the remarkable diversity and beauty of nature and our place within it. He has served on the Board of Trustees for the Wisconsin Nature Conservancy, the River Alliance of Wisconsin, and the Wisconsin Humanities Council. He currently serves on the board of Northwoods Land Trust. John has an MS in Environmental Science from the University of Wisconsin Green Bay. John and his wife, fiber artist Mary Burns, live on the Manitouish River in Iron County, Wisconsin, where they raise two daughters. Join me in welcoming John Bates. Let's see, can you all hear me all right? Yep. Excellent, good, thank you. Thanks for coming out tonight. Uh, what a beautiful night. I would have stayed home if I were you, but I appreciate your, <laughs> your coming out. Um, how are the mosquitoes down here? Well, our mosquitoes are killing us up north. We've lived up there for 39 years, full. And this rates as one of the top two years of mosquitoes. We, we drive into our driveway and we look at one another and say, you ready, set, and we literally run to the door slam the door behind us. Anyway, it's rough up north, so if you're coming up north, wait a couple, three weeks maybe, and uh, mosquitoes will be down a bit, hopefully, by then. The black flies are done. Usually they're a two or three week phenomena, late May, or first week or so of June, and they tend to trail off, but the skeeters will last a lot longer. With an audience this large and, and this experienced, I often say please interrupt at any point with, with questions, your experience. I, I want to acknowledge there's a tremendous amount of uh, wisdom in, in this group, I'm sure. Um, however, we've been asked to wait until the end to ask questions, so please save them. And if you have better stories, better jokes, better anything that should have been shared, please uh, hold on to that and share it at the end. That would be great. I always like to start with just that simple phrase, a place is a space with a story. I want to tell you stories about lakes. Um, and you know, the stories, there's thousands of stories in any particular place. You put all those stories together into a larger region, in this case northern Wisconsin and all the lakes, and you end up with a mammoth novel uh, that's very hard to, to try to summarize in, in a talk like tonight or, or in a book. But that's what we're going to try to do. I'm going to try to tell you a few stories anyway about 
about the lakes that we still have that are wild, um, still as God and evolution intended them to be. We live in Iron County on a, on, in a little uh, crossroads of Manitouish, population 29. We live in Mary's grandparents' old home. And uh, uh, Frog Lake is just across the river, the Manitouish River, from our home. It's a, it's a wild lake, just a half mile away, and Mary's grandparents' own property near this lake on the other side of the river as well as where we live today. And I, I got to wondering, we have this wild lake here. What, what other lakes are there in the state that are completely undeveloped? Um, what, what, what do we have left? As someone who has paddled the, the boundary waters, how many of you have paddled the boundary waters here? Quite a few of you. Gone to places like that where you've, you've seen literally hundreds of, of lakes that are wild and contiguous in the case of Minnesota's boundary waters. I wonder what we had done in Wisconsin at all similar. Also happened to live in Manitouish in a place where there's six other wild lakes right close to us. So you can look um, oh, down in the right hand corner there's Sherman Lake, that's a wild lake, Sandy Beach and, and Mud Lake uh, more or less in the middle there. Those are wild undeveloped lakes. Plunkett Lake just on the north side of Highway 51 is a wild lake and Brush Lake and Kelly Lake up there are really wilderness lakes. You've got to slog through a whole lot of bog to get to those places. So we're really blessed with, with undeveloped lakes in this little tiny place in, uh, in southeastern Iron County. So the question was, is anybody else like us at all? When we think of wild lakes, we tend to think of big places. We tend to think of the BWCAW, um, which is it's an unfair comparison. They have 1,200 miles of canoe routes, over 1,100 lakes from 10 acres to, to 10,000 acres. Uh, it's just, it's a million acre wilderness, uh, all connected via portage trails. It's the best um, kayaking, canoeing place in all of North America, fundamentally. But what does Wisconsin have, and where are those places, and what are their stories? So that was what I endeavored to, to try. I needed an adventure. I'm retired. It's like, you know, either going to drive Mary crazy being home or I should get out of the house and go wander around and have an adventure. And that's what, we, what I did for five years starting in uh, 2016. Um, visited, tried to visit all these lakes in northern Wisconsin that I could determine were, were undeveloped. Got lost a lot, went down a lot of uh, old logging roads hoping those would be the source of where the, some of these lakes were. Um, but what a fun time it was to, to do this. The other reason for doing it besides this, this joy of, of, of adventure was I wanted to put myself in the way of grace. And that's that old biblical kind of statement, put yourself in the way of grace every day if you can. Um, there's an emotional, spiritual place in me that when I get to a, a, a beautiful lake that is wild, undeveloped, that is the way it's fundamentally been for the last 10,000 years, I feel something. I feel something very powerful that I'm not afraid to say it's somewhat spiritual for me to be in, be in those kind of places. So I wanted to, in my aging years, to put myself in those places. Great quote here by Wallace J. Nichols says, the best and biggest benefits of water are all emotional. We love being in, on, under, around, or near it. Try as we might, no amount of scientific data, MRIs, scans, EEG readings, carefully designed research projects can really show us exactly what we feel at those moments being on water. In order to do a book like this, you have to define what a lake is, and I want to dispel the rumors, or the, uh, at least the competition between Minnesota and Wisconsin, who has the most lakes. Uh, <laughs> Wisconsin has what we define, what we call lakes, 15,000 plus lakes. Minnesota only has 11,842. But our definition of a lake is two acres or more, which is little more than a puddle, a pond, if you will, whereas Minnesota defines theirs as 10 acres or more. So if you looked at, if you compare apples to apples, Minnesota kicks our butt on this particular uh, competition. They have way more lakes than we do. Uh, we only have 5,898 compared, over 10 acres compared to their 11,842. We did a 25-acre cutoff. They still have twice as many as we do. So they win. But that's okay. Uh, what I found interesting is Minnesota is the land of 10,000 lakes, right? That's on their license plates. It just they couldn't put the land of 11,842 lakes because 
No one will ever remember that number. It's just such a mouthful. So they actually, for uh, uh, commercial purposes, you know, to bring people to their land, to their estate, they, they reduced their number. They, they actually said they had fewer than what they really had. Land of 10,000 lakes. All of our lakes, or nearly all of our lakes anyway, are pothole kettle lakes. These are ice block depressions. When the lake glaciers receded, they would calve off these big chunks of ice and they would lay in all the rubble and the till. And when they slowly melted, you'd end up with, with these depressions that were filled with water. And most are really small and shallow here in northern Wisconsin. 50%, uh, more than 50% of the Vios and Oneida County lakes are less than 10 acres deep. Sorry, less than 10 acres of surface area. And most of them, 9 out of 10 in Oneida County, are less than 25 feet deep. So these are little, little lakes by and large. However, the lakes in Vilas County are of global importance. I try to always impress this on all, all of us who live up there. We are one of the, the highest density areas in the entire world in, in these Kettle Lakes. Vilas County is 16% of the surface area is lakes, another 17% is wetlands. That's 33%. So for every three steps you take in Vilas County, one squishes. It's a really, <laughs> it's a wet place and thus a globally important place. So I had to, for the purposes of doing this book, I had to determine what, what kind of lakes were I was going to look at. If I looked at all the five acre and three acre kind of stuff, I, I, I would be long dead before I was able to do that. So I arbitrarily decided all the lakes had to be at least 30 acres. They had to be completely surrounded by publicly owned land. It could not have any private land on it. Even if it was uh, undeveloped, I still didn't want private land because someone could tomorrow put up a house. Had to be natural lakes, no dams. No, they, you know, if you have a dam, you're a flowage. You're not a natural lake anymore. And there could be no private homes visible. So I actually put this particular lake picture down here. This is Plummer Lake in Chippewa County. Uh, it has a, uh, its lake shoreline is completely publicly owned, but uh, the person up on the hill there uh, clear cut down to, uh, uh, to create a view shed. And it's hard to blame the person. They wanted to see the lake. But because that, that, uh, that was visible from the lake shore and from being on the lake in a canoe, I, I disallowed that one and did not include it. So you couldn't see any homes from the, sh from the lake itself. But I compromised and said they could have campgrounds on there and, and they could allow motors. Um, which begs the question of how wild, therefore, is wild. A lot of folks said to me, well, if you, if you have motors on a lake, even though it's undeveloped, it's hardly wild. And they have a good point. Um, so a number of the lakes that are, are there in the book that we found did have piers going out on them, had boat landings, had campgrounds, as I was saying. Um, Sweeney Lake here on the, on the right has a big parking lot, and large motor boats are coming in there all the time because it's a fisherman's paradise. Um, but it's an undeveloped state-owned lake that's quite large and quite beautiful. Uh, nevertheless, you have to dodge motorboats if you're out there in a canoe or kayak. Some of the places, though, were quite difficult to get to. Grandma Lake up here in, in Florence County, it's a 10 or 15 minute uh, portage into the bog, which you then have to walk across about 100 yards across bog to get to the lake itself. Riley Lake, also in Florence County over here, um, it, the trail to it has been completely submerged via a uh, bunch of beaver dams. So here's Mary trying to, to pick our way across what is now basically a beaver dam rather than a trail, trying to get back, gosh, almost a mile back into Riley Lake. So that was quite difficult. We still made it. However, some we never made it to, to be honest. Um, we're old, you know. We weren't willing to suffer quite that much. Uh, if I was 25 or 30, maybe I would have crossed the half mile of bog to get to Ponds Lake there in Price County. But, you know, we always say wear a red hat if you're going to walk in a bog so somebody can find you later. So <laughs> at least find your hat, yeah. Um, I didn't want to cross that. So there was a number of lakes in the book, uh, about 10 that we never got to simply because they were so dang hard to, to try to get to. In the case of Gates Lake here, we got to the that little road there on the far left, and this old road, old logging road, was supposed to be in there. But it completely grown up into an aspen uh, dog hair stand. You ever try to walk through a young aspen? It's virtually impossible. And, and that day, that was about May 20th or so, and that particular day was the first hatch of mosquitoes. <laughs> and it was, oh God, awful. Everywhere, open up the door, and there were swarms, and we both looked at each other and said, no, 
and we drove on. So I don't know what's at Gates Lake, but it is in the book, and we give you directions on how to get there. So feel free <laughs> to go find it. Uh, but good luck. So it was a five-year adventure trying to find all these places. The way I found them was by looking at plat books, bought plat books from uh, every county in the northern part of the state, and I went to the DNR website, which is exceptional. The DNR has every lake in the state uh, described, so you can punch in whatever lake you want to know anything about, and it'll give you the depth and the sediments and the acreage and so forth. So a great resource right there. And then looked at topo maps, trying to figure out how in the heck to get to the, to the site so that we could paddle them if we could. We paddled most of them. Some of them we were only able to walk into because it was just too darn hard, like Riley Lake, to even carry a canoe into. But most of them we did actually get to paddle. So why paddle lakes? Well, here's what they don't have. Uh, this is a lake in China. Um, can you imagine? Um, that's one reason to paddle or to sit by a wild lake is not to have that. Wild lakes also don't have wave runners, don't have uh, jet skis, don't have marinas, don't have McMansions, don't have a lot of things that to me detract from the real reason most of us want to have property or, or want to visit lakes is because of the wildlife, because of the peace, because of the presence of that place is altered to some extent by these things. They also tended not to have invasive species, which I was really delighted to find. Very few of them had any uh, zebra mussels or curly leaf pondweed and so forth. Most were, because they were difficult to get to and most did not have boat landings, um, most were free of plants that weren't supposed to be there. So what values do they have? Those are the things they don't have. Well, bottom line value is they're wild. They're wild places, a rare uh, commodity these days in Wisconsin. And they're found in, in, by and large, in rather small places. But, so we don't have a Boundary Waters Wilderness. We don't have a million acres plus, but we have these little lakes patched here and there and everywhere. And each one of those has its own personality, has its own uh, soul, if you will, that's worth trying to understand. I love this quote by Jack Turner in his book, The Abstract Wild. He says, without the experience of qualities such as wildness, magic, spirit, and the sacred, we treat flora and fauna as resources and playgrounds. And I love the fact that he's, he uses wildness and then adds magic, spirit, and the sacred. And uh, however you'd like to, to define the word sacred, I don't use it in necessarily a religious context, but in a context of a place that needs to be fully honored. That, to me, is what's sacred, and that's what these places are. John Muir thought if we just got everybody into these wild places that conservation would happen automatically. He wrote back in 1895, few are altogether deaf to the preaching of pine trees. Their sermons on the mountains go to our heart, and people in general could be got into the woods, even for once, to hear the trees speak for themselves. All difficulties in the way of forest preservation would vanish. Jack Turner responded, they got into the woods, but not everyone heard the trees speak. Muir could not have understood that setting aside a wild area would not in itself foster intimacy with the wild. So I'm acutely aware of that fact, and one of the reasons for writing the book was to get to people into these lakes, but I'm, I'm very much aware that not everyone will look at those lakes with the love and the conservation mind that I would like them to bring to it. Others may just simply see it as a, as a, as a resource to plunder. Um, Nevertheless, I'm hoping that in, in having written the book that people will, for the most part, fall in love with these places. And when you fall in, places, fall in love with places, you can serve them. The bottom quote here is from Stephen Jay Gould. We cannot win this battle to save species and environments without forging an emotional bond between ourselves and nature as well. For we will not fight to save what we do not love. James Kunstler wrote a book in 1993 called The Geography of Nowhere, and he was talking about all this monotonous cookie-cutter development that happens in most of our cities, and our small towns for that matter. Some of you may remember Malvina Reynolds' song, Little Boxes. Anybody remember that song from back when, all the folk, folkies from back then? And Kunstler was talking about how places had lost their souls, and the places were now nowhere. They weren't somewhere, they were nowhere, because every place tended to look the same. He said, no one wants to live in nowhere. So I, these wild places, to me, uh, are a geography of somewhere. And that's what Kunstler was saying. We need to create a geography of somewhere. Every place has to have 
its own personality, a recognizable soul, if you will, because we all want to belong to somewhere remarkable and somewhere unique. So a little, just a little science about how uh, wild lakes differ from developed lakes. Uh, this was a study done in 1997 on some Vilas County lakes near us uh, by the DNR. And this is just plants. And that, since that's the foundation of everything, look how much more canopy there is left on undeveloped lakes, how much more understory is left, and how much more shrub layer is left. And that's where all the birds live. That's where all the mammals live. That's where all wildlife is living in those and utilizing that plant life. Give an example of a specific species they studied also in 1997, green frogs. They're all calling right now. They're the ones that sound like a loose banjo twang, gonk, kind of gonky sound. I can't do it. Can anybody do a green frog imitation? No one in any audience has ever been able to do one. I'm waiting for someone to do green frogs. Anyway, if you can look at this chart to, uh, where there are no homes whatsoever, there were 40, frog, 40 green frogs per mile. As development increased to where there were 30 homes per mile, green frogs completely fell out. So it would be interesting to do studies on every single species. Some species do better with development. Uh, other species do not, of course. So who benefits and, and who, who loses? A cost-benefit analysis would be mighty interesting to do. And here was an analysis of, of bird life comparing undeveloped lakes to developed lakes, also again from this cadre of, of scientists back in 1997. I don't know if you can read some of these birds that, that were much more present on uh, developed lakes. And perfectly fine birds, pine siskins and eastern phoebes and orioles and catbirds and great crested flycatchers, kingbirds, wonderful birds. What's interesting about this study is they found the same abundance of birds, overall same number of birds, on developed lakes as they found on undeveloped lakes. But what they found was a completely different, not completely different, but significantly different cadre constellation of birds. So the birds on the wild lakes were black-throated blue warblers and yellow-throated vireos and brown creepers and hermit thrushes and northern perulas, solitary vireos, etc. Uh, birds that by and large nest on the ground or nest in shrubs or nest in old growth cavities, those things being generally eliminated on developed lakes. So there's a, there's a, uh, a difference qualitatively uh, but not quantitatively in, in the bird life on developed versus undeveloped lakes. What are some of the values of, of wildness? Why, again, should any of us care to have wild places? And by the way, we can have some development on lakes and still keep them wild. I'm sure some of you are working very hard where you live, if you live on a lake, to still maintain some of those wild values. But in terms of a totally wild system, well, the most important thing is they support a fully uh, functioning array of species. In doing so, they also uh, support diversity of habitats and diversity of processes and interactions that would take place on that lake that might not take place on the developed lake. So predator-prey interactions or nutrient exchanges between land and, and water are altered when you develop a lake. As important as anything, maybe are the next two, uh, these wild lakes are storehouses of genetic diversity. There are parts inventory. Leopold always said uh, to make sure to save all the parts. So these are places that if the time comes on, on developed lakes where we no longer have the species that we, we know should be there, we can potentially go to these wild lakes and, and find some of those species, possibly transplant some to reestablish sites. But maybe as, as important as anything as, as these wild lakes are scientific benchmarks. They're the gold standard by what god evolution, however we want to parse that, had intended lakes to be. So what's normal? I remember speaking with Tim Crotts, who was the director of, of the uh, Trout Lake Limnology Lab up in Boulder Junction, asking him what Trout Lake was trying to now understand. This was in the early 2000s. Trout Lake was begun in 1926. And they have hundreds and hundreds, well, thousands of, of studies that have been done there. Mining shells. I said, what are you still trying to figure out? And Tim said to me, we're still trying to figure out what's normal. I thought that was just fascinating. He said, what? We don't understand yet what makes this lake normal versus this lake, because lakes vary so dramatically. Even though they're right next door to one another, one may be uh, sustaining a whole lot of algal development, another one may be crystal clear. And you look at them, you go, oh, what's the difference? Why? But anyway, so there's the scientific benchmark that if you're a manager of water, or if you're someone who lives on water, how do you know what you're supposed to do? 
suggest one of the ways is to model a, uh, what you do on your lake uh, by looking at wild lakes and seeing what they do. And all the values of education and recreation and, and beauty, I, I always try to remind folks that beauty is not optional. Why do so many people live up north and visit up north? Uh, those of us who live there did not go there to get rich. If we did, we were completely out of our minds. That wasn't going to happen for most of us. We came up there for beauty or some form of recreation possibly, but beauty in more than anything else. The value of simply sitting on the end of a dock and looking out of out a peaceful lake. You all live here on a chain of lakes or nearest chain. You know, maybe you all don't live here, here in Wapaka, but uh, you all know what I'm talking about, right? The value of that piece, of that ability to, to decompress, to let go of things by being in the midst of beauty um, is invaluable. It's, it's, it's una I'm unable to express what that really means. All I know is it means everything. And finally, these uh, wild places are a reservoir of what's sacred, or a reservoir of peace, which is darn hard to find these days. And that's good for our soul. So what are some of the values of wilderness? A guy named Paul Drukow uh, wrote uh, a great essay as part of a book on, on the Boundary Waters, and he, he listed a number of values of, of wild places. And he talked about the value of silence, that uh, there's no noise that doesn't belong in these places. The noise that you hear is what's supposed to be there. Sigurd Olson has that quote, the, wild, the wilderness sings because it contains so much silence. Here's a winter wren singing. I don't know if we'll be able to hear it. I don't know if anybody can actually hear that. Oh, I guess that's not working. Oh, we were trying to turn up the volume because we've been having some trouble with this. Uh, but it's just a gorgeous, incredibly compressed little song. It goes for six seconds or so. The bird sings on the in-breath and the out-breath. It's an amazing little song. If you're a birder, you know about this song. Here's, I don't know if you'll be able to hear this, but here's the song shortened or slowed down to one sixth speed. I just love that. It always gives me chills to hear that. I don't know what winter wrens are trying to, to communicate when they compress all of those notes into that very fast song. But there's a lot of notes. There's a lot of orchestration going on there. The value of solitude is very important in wild places. You know, uh, solitude is a choice. Loneliness is not a choice. Loneliness is something we all try to avoid as best we can. Solitude is something we seek out. It's a positive state. It's a place where your own company is sufficient, where you are who you want to be, where you want to be. The value of self-reliance. I like this last line in the wild. Ego is as useless as money. It doesn't matter if you're the CEO of the biggest company in the world. Um, ego won't do you a darn bit of good out in that wild place. You better know how to take care of yourself. There's nobody to blame. You better have all the skills that you need to do what you're doing. You better be fully present. You have to pay attention. You can't just be messing around hoping that things go good. You have to know what you're doing in wild places. And that's really wonderful. All of us want that 100% moment where we're totally focused, we're totally passionately engaged. Wild places require you to do that. The value of humility. When you're out in a wild place, at least for me, you know, the old adage of the more you know, the less you know uh, is really true. The older we get, I think we all figure that one out pretty quick. Um, Wilderness teaches us that nothing's there uh, according to our agency, according to anything that we had anything to do with. We're just a visitor in those places. Um, it's a quick recognition of how little you know. And Terry Tempest Williams has this great quote. She says, equality is expressed through humility. Think about that. Equality is expressed through humility. If you're humble enough to, to see 
equal beings out amongst yourself, whether they be plants or birds, other paddlers or whoever. Uh, that is done through humility by understanding that you aren't everything and that you have needs that need to be shared and need to be met by other people and by other plants and animals. The value of meditation and contemplation. Um, there's nothing else to do out there other than to, th <laughs> to think. Fortunately, at least hopefully, you don't have a, a cell phone, you don't have email or tweets or the radio or the TV or anything else out there to mess with your brain. It's, there's nothing else to do but to think and to feel and to be in these places. Um, and each day, when, when Mary and I lead trips, and sometimes we do three or four day long uh, programs with people where we go to a place and stay there, by the third or fourth day, people have sloughed off all the anxieties, not all, but an awful lot of them, and fears and angers and distresses that they brought with them from wherever they came. And I remember this one trip we did by the fourth day. We, could get, we couldn't get people to move. They wanted to know everything and look at everything. And I was like, we've got to keep moving, people. Come on. And I usually am slowing everybody down. But these folks were so engaged. They would let go of all this other stuff. And they, just, they were like in a, a four-year-old mind of just being in love with everything there. It was really an awesome moment and a problematic moment because we had to get to the end of the trail. And we were going to be there till dark at the pace they were going. Anyway, so that's the value of, of meditation, sloughing off all that stuff and trying to figure out why we're here and what we're going to do with this uh, incredible gift of a life. The last value of, of wild places, is it, it's an avenue, a doorway to falling in love with the natural world. I love the quote by uh, Leopold, we only grieve for what we know. If we don't fall in love with places, we're not going to grieve for them when they're gone. Uh, so we protect what we love. And we learn to love the world bird by bird, flower by flower, fish by fish, plant by plant. And there's no short course. It's, it's a lifetime of work, and then you still don't know one gazillionth of what you ought to know because it's so complex out there. But we need both this ecological literacy and we need an education of the heart. We need to combine those two things to have wisdom how we're going to live out the rest of our lives. So a little bit of science that I threw in the book as well. Uh, I wasn't trying to write a limnology textbook. I'm not smart enough to write a limnology textbook. Uh, but I wanted to still, at the same time, for people when they paddle on lakes, I wanted them to think about a number of things and why do lakes natu naturally differ. So when you approach a lake, you can be trying to look for these things. And I find that totally enriching to your experience out there because now you feel more like you belong. You're not a tourist just passing through. You're actually um, analyzing and being a part of that place because you're, you're, you're trying to discover the personality of the place. So here's some of the things that you need to think about. We'll just run through a few of them. Uh, lakes high in the landscape are real different than lakes low in the landscape. So if you think of uh, lakes, you think of the landscape as a big sandbox. Where I live, it's all sand. Uh, if you're at the top of the sandbox, all your, your lake is getting its water from precipitation. You have very few nutrients. So lakes at the top of the sandbox at the highest elevation in the landscape tend to be very clear, tend to be oligotrophic, uh, tend to have fewer fish species, tend to have less diversity, etc. The more sensitive to drought, all these things. But as you get down lower in the landscape, you get not only runoff on the surface uh, and you get erosion, you get more plant life bringing nutrients into your lake, but you're also getting groundwater coming in through the soils get lower and lower and lower, you get more and more nutrients. So where do you want to swim? Lakes highest in the landscape where the water is clearest. Where do you want to fish? Lakes lowest in the landscape because they have the most nutrients by and large. These are big generalities, right? But lakes lowest in the landscape, they have the most nutrients which are habitat for all the fish. So where, when you're looking at lakes and trying to see why do they differ, check out, check out the elevation. And just a little bit of elevation matters hugely. Here in uh, Vilas County, here's an example of Crystal Lake being six feet higher than Big Muscalunge Lake. That's all the higher it is. They only are separated by about, oh, 50 yards or so between them. But they're very different lakes. They're different for other reasons than elevation. But groundwater moves, takes six years for groundwater to move from Crystal Lake into Big Musky Lake, but it carries nutrients. And Big Musky Lake is loaded with plant life. Crystal Lake is a crystal lake. It has very little plant life, very little diversity, and uh, abundance of fish compared to Big Muskie, in large part because of the difference of only six feet in elevation. The shape of the lake matters. The more irregular your shoreline, the more nutrients are going to come in from that shoreline. If you're an almost perfectly circular lake, circular lake like Crystal, 
you don't have very much shoreline compared to that oddly shaped Renard Lake over there in Bayfield County. It weaves in and out. You've got a lot more plant species all along there. You've got more input of uh, groundwater coming in via just having more shoreline. So the irregularity of the shoreline matters. More nutrients come in with a more irregular lake shape. The watershed size matters if you can find this information. A small watershed has very few nutrients coming in again. So here's Moon Lake. It's a tiny watershed of only 345 acres. It's a seepage lake, but it's got 16-foot uh, water clarity. That's very good. That's an oligotrophic to mesotrophic, but more oligotrophic lake. Right next to, uh, to that lake is Little St. Germain, this long, irregularly shaped lake. And its average secchi disc is only 5 feet compared to 16 feet. They, they're separated, Moon Lake, from Little St. Germain by Again, 50, 75 yards is all, but totally different. And where you get up in that East Bay right above uh, Moon Lake, it's only 1.5 feet secchi disc clarity compared again to the 16 feet in Moon Lake, and they're right next to each other. So, it's, But the watershed of Little St. Germain is huge, 6,400 acres compared to that 300 or so acres for Moon Lake. Then there's the food web, which I found really fascinating long ago when I was uh, told, told about this. but Having predator fish in your lake clears up your lake. Okay, so if you can follow this, so the more walleye and the more muskies and the more big predators you have, the more prey fish they eat, right? Does that make sense? So the more, if you reduce the number of prey fish, prey fish eat zooplankters. Zooplankters, if you remember ninth grade biology and looking in that drop of water and all these little things were swimming around and the and your response was, my God, I drink that stuff, I can't believe I'm not dead. Those are those little things swimming around in there. Those are zooplankters. If you don't have very many prey fish, you have way more zooplankton. What does zooplankton eat? Phytoplankton. What's phytoplankton? Algae. So if you have way more zooplankters, you will reduce the algae le level, phytoplankton, there's other forms, in your lake. And this was an interesting experiment done in Madison where they looked at Lake Mendota and they said, well, how are we going to clear up some of the the algae in Lake Mendota were going to introduce predators. And the DNR did this. They introduced 2,700,000 walleye. Wow. 170,000 northern pike. It was a bio-manipulation experiment. And the whole idea was if they increased all those predators, they would decrease the amount of algae in the lake. And it worked. They decreased the, uh, they increased the clarity, I think it was by three feet. But what they hadn't thought about was something could interject itself. One thing that should have come clear to them. So they had all those predators out there. A whole bunch of things called fishermen showed up who wanted to catch all those predators. So that was kind of an issue. But the bigger thing was a little uh, zooplankter called a, a spiny water flea came in. Uh, and it was, it was eating all, I'm sorry, it was a, it's a predator of, of zooplankters. It was devastating the daphnia, which is a zooplankter. So it's an invasive species, spiny water fleas. Uh, and they ate all these daphnia which therefore, because the zooplankton population went down, the phytoplankton went up and end up with the clarity decreasing by three feet because who, who could have anticipated spiny water fleas showing up in, in the water bodies? But a really interesting experiment demonstrating that, that the, the community of fish actually has an impact on the clarity of a lake. Clean it up, clean it up. Criminy, it's supposed to be a rat hole. I love this cartoon. It's one of my favorite cartoons. Cleanliness along a lake is not next to godliness, so one of the things that's really important to lakes is the amount of, of habitat, meaning the number of trees and shrubs and uh, uh, understory species that are left along that shore, shoreline. Dead and dying trees provide habitat. And there's, there's a number of studies that, have, that show this. Any, anybody, how many people are anglers here? How many go fishing? You know, about probably a third of folks here. Do you fish close to structure? Do you fish close to where there are trees falling down? I'm seeing lots of heads nodding. What we want are trees to die and to fall into the water. It's what we want. What do most of us who live along lakes do when a tree falls into the water by our property? We get it the heck out of there because now it impacts our swimming or it's too close to our pier and our boat can't get through or whatever. And then we blame the DNR or the Native Americans for decreasing the fish in our lake kind of problematic. Uh, those dead and dying trees are enormously important. 
And what's come out in the last decade, which is great, is this whole concept of fish sticks, rather than putting fish cribs in lakes, which are just, you know, you're putting all this wood out in the middle of the lake, and it's going to have a great number of uh, fish attracted to it, but also who gets attracted to it? Every fisherman who knows where the fish crib is. You're not increasing the fish in your lake by having fish cribs, but if you have fish sticks, which I like that description, and you're dropping trees all along the shoreline to provide habitat uh, for fish and for aquatic insects, frogs, all, all the things that are necessary as part of that food base, you're going to increase uh, that whole community of life. So we need to make sure places remain a rat hole. They have to, they have, to have uh, random chaos. The other term is habitat. Ontario study looked at uh, trees in the water, and I thought this was fascinating. They found the average age of the logs, how long they had been in the water, was 443 years. When wood falls in the water, it stays there for a very long time. Oxygen can't get to it to decompose it, right? Some had been in the water for as long as 1,000 years. So long now. So it's really important um, if we can leave those, uh, that woody habitat in the water. Study on northern lakes. My way again, looking at a, a lake shore like this one, it takes 200 years to replace the down trees that are removed from nearly all developed shorelines in Wisconsin. 200 years if we do that. So anyway, let's look at a, a sampler of the, some of the wild lakes I found. Um, Mary and I found. Mary went with me a good number of the times. Still loves me to this day, which is kind of remarkable. So uh, there was. I'll get, just take you through six different counties and give you one or two lakes from there, just as a sampler. Uh, we wrote a, write about it in the book, 55 different lakes. We give full descriptions of maps to so forth and so on. Another 64, uh, I give only a short paragraph to, but so you know about them, and I, and I give you latitude and longitude so you can find them. And I kept 10 secret, um, mainly because I got a lot of harassment from different people including my wife, if I can't tell people about that lake because it's a lake that different people went to and they didn't want anybody else going there. So I did keep 10 secret. Anyhow, over in Forest County, here's McKinley Lake. You can see it right there in the middle. It's a 48-acre lake, 20-foot maximum depth. Here's me putting in at the little tiny boat landing, if you want to call it that. And what I found with the, the highlight of this particular lake were all of the downed logs down trees that had been there for decades and decades and decades that had been colonized by bog plants. These are now bog logs, right? And on these logs, in particular, was a plant called sundew, which is a little carnivorous plant. Those are all, you can see all that red in there? That's all sundews all along the length of that log, and there's dozens and dozens of these really bog habitat, which takes a long time to form. Here's the sundew plant itself. It's a, uh, it's a sticky, a platform for uh, each of those, those leaves are sticky at the end, and when a, uh, hopefully a mosquito lands on it, it gets, it's the original flypaper. Native Americans used to pick these and hang them in their wigwams as the original flypaper. Um, and then the sundew slowly closes the leaf over the course, I guess, of a half hour, 45 minutes, something like that, and dissolves and eats that insect. But anyway, these logs are covered in these sundews. There are also uh, on this lake rose pagonia orchids. Yes, oodles and oodles of, of various shoreland, uh, beautiful plant life all along that shoreland, steeple bush and marsh skullcap and a bunch of other, just a riot of color and along with those logs in the water. It was just maybe the most beautiful lake from a plant standpoint out of all those that I paddled. What's also cool about uh, McKinley Lake is you can see it way up here in the, and it's surrounded by uh, Bowes Lake, which only has one house on it, three Johns Lake has uh, two or three houses on it. Two Dutchmen has no houses. Luna Lake is a wild lake. White Deer Lake is a wild lake. Pat Shea Lake is a wild lake. And there's a 12 mile long hiking trail that goes all the way around here. So one of the things I wanted to do in the book was give you other values to these places so when you go to a little lake like a 42 acre McKinley Lake, you're going to paddle around it in a couple, two or three hours. Depends on how slow you want to poke around looking at plants. But then you'll be done. But what else could you do? Well. This is now a number of days that you could spend in this area doing all kinds of stuff. So I wanted to, to point out in the book of these other values I thought that were really cool that have been protected as well. Up in Iron County where Mary and I live, here's Frog Lake and Pines that I already talked to you about. It's a state natural area, 1,290 acres. Its highlight on the water is a little 
plant called purple bladderworts. Is anybody here familiar with bladderworts, just out of curiosity? Two, three hands. Not many people know bladderworts. This is the world's fastest moving plant. So this is the Usain Bolt of the plant world. If we had an Olympics for fastest moving plant, this would be it. And by fastest moving plant, what I mean is, you see all those little bladders on the right? Those are little trapdoor bladders that as, as little Daphnia and other zooplankters swim along, that, that trapdoor opens and closes in one 460th of a second. You can't possibly see it, but that makes it the world's fastest moving plant, which I think is a completely ludicrous and useless fact, but I like to always share it with everybody, <laughs> just because it's kind of cool. That, that plant moves that fast. Anyway, there's thousands of these purple bladderworts on Frog Lake. I also want to remind folks that when you're, a wild lake is not just a cool place, a remarkable place to be on or around during the summer. We snowshoe and ski around Frog Lake all the time because, again, it's only a half mile from our house. And in the case of Frog Lake, it's shoreland. It's got some of the biggest pines left in the state. There's a red pine on the left with a big fire scar on it. I took it from the DNR, is doing a fire study, did a, took a tree cookie out of the base of that. You can see that kind of scar at the base, and he found that tree was uh, begun in 1803, and it had fire scars in 18, if I, this will be approximations, 1835, 1846, 1857, 1868, 1873, and then 1890-something. So almost every decade, right across from our house, that woodland had been burning. Everybody down the south here knows that uh, in Prairie and Oak Savannah that Native American people were burning, but most people don't think the Native Americans up our way were ever burning. This is proof positive for me at least that Native Americans were burning regularly up in our area as well. And what would you burn for? Well, Mary and I know a number of the Native American elders in the Lacta Flambeau Reservation, and they say, oh, yeah, we burned up here all the time. All the elders tell us we burned all the time. In fact, one road at the Lacta Flambeau Reservation is called Prairie Lane. Why did they burn? Blueberries. What comes up after a burn? Blueberries, strawberries, blackberries, raspberries, a fresh bite for deer, for grouse. It's great habitat for wildlife and for, for berry collecting. So Native Americans were burning up north as well. Big white pines on Frog Lake as well. Moose Lake up in uh, more north central Iron County. It's one of the larger lakes. We don't have a lake, by the way, that's a full square mile. It's wild and left in the entire state. We don't have 640 acres of wild water left. That's how much we've developed all of our lakes. This is the big, well, I'll get to the biggest one in a moment. Moose Lake, I think, ranks number five at 270 acres. It's 12 foot maximum depth, only six foot mean depth. That topo map shows houses there on, on the east shoreline. Those have all been taken down. It's part of a state and area. It is 4,293 acres large. Some of the, the highlights of this site are trumpeter swans nesting, um, a lot of tussock sedge along the shoreline. These are ankle busters if you try to walk through tussock sedge. A lot, I don't know, three or four beaver lodges, a lot of pickerel weed, one of the more common aquatic plants along the shoreline there. Going to Oneida County, there's Kennard Lake, has a campground on it. So here's one that I included that has a campground, but it's a wild lake with a, a stream that uh, connects it to Sweeney Lake, which is another wild lake. Um, 23 foot maximum depth, a small lake again, 44 acres. Its keynote to me was all the white water lilies. Big colonies, uh, white water lilies, a clonal plant, it, it spreads via underground, sorry, under the sediment uh, rhizomes and up comes uh, new plants. Um, these guys, these colonies say, say the aquatic ecologists can be over 100 years old, so when we talk about old growth, white water lily colonies are old growth. They've been around a long time. Hopefully you've all smelled a white water lily leaning over your canoe and almost capsizing. To do so, they smell a lot like fresh oranges to me if you get a good one. They're really a lovely smelling flower. I bought a camera for this uh, project uh, going to all these lakes and 95% of my pictures came out blurry because I, I wasn't underwater so I couldn't focus. I'm just holding the camera right there and pushing the button hoping something good happened. Here's something that good that happened. One of the rare times is I got a nice picture of the underwater stems coming up in the white water lily column. I thought that was really big. <coughs> Canard also has just a whole lot of, of aquatic plants. Remember, aquatic plants, think of them as, as uh, understory plants in a forest. If you don't have understory plants in a forest, you 
you're not going to have wildlife. And if you don't have aquatic plants in a lake, you're not going to have wildlife either. You have to have some plants. Too much of a good thing is a bad thing, but this particular lake had wonderful diversity and wealth of plants that made it good for a whole lot of other wildlife species. Rose begonia, orchids were on the north side. Great place. Also in Oneida County is McNaughton Lake, 120 million acres. Probably the reason it's still a wild lake is it's only a four foot mean depth. Maximum depth is nine feet. Not a place you're going to go water skiing or do much anything with and it's pretty silty and got some sand but generally not a place that you're going to want to walk around in much. Uh, but it's a beautiful little lake. Uh, lots of bird life. Has water willow, swamp loose stripe is one of the uh, shrub species uh, on the north end of the, of, the, uh, of the lake that I find really beautiful. This lake had more northern water snakes than any other lake we visited. Uh, so if you don't like water snakes, don't go to McNaughton Lake. There are a lot in this particular water. Um, they're not poisonous. They won't harm you in any manner unless you try to grab one, then they will bite you. But most of us would bite somebody who tries to grab us and shake us and look at us. So. Don Lake, though, that was kind of its highlight, where all these northern water snakes that you could see in, in the clear water. Let's go into Price County. There's Tucker Lake. You have to portage into Tucker Lake. The easiest way is to, to boat across Round Lake. And you can see where there's a little trail from the northern end of Round Lake heading up into Tucker Lake. 107 acres. What's cool about Tucker Lake is it's a state natural area. It's also a research natural area, which is the federal designation for exceptionally important places. I think we only have 19 research natural natural areas in the Shawanga and Nicolay Natural For National Forest. This is one of those. It has about 68 acres of old growth forest right there as, in the portaging area that you'd be in. There's also a beautiful trail that walks around Round Lake that actually we're leading a hike for the Natural Resources Foundation this summer in. If you want to join us in going back to in this particular lake. And here's our youngest daughter and our Australian Shepherd walking along that portage path through some big eastern hemlocks, uh, heading back to Tucker Lake. Isles County had the most wild lakes left in the state, 24 lakes. Won the competition by a landslide. I think the next best county had 14. Maybe. So we'll just do a couple here. Bittersweet Lake State Natural Area. One of the only places in our entire state where lakes are connected via portage trail. And there's only four lakes here, but each one is connected via Porter's Trail. Amazingly enough, we have almost nowhere in the state that you can go where there's a linkage between lakes of Porter's Trails. It just doesn't exist. It's something, for whatever reason, we never did. One of the reasons for writing the book is to try to get people to pound on tables with the DNR or the National Forest and say, let's do that. Let's, if where we can, let's establish Porter's Trails. They may have been there in the first place. Let's reestablish them. People have these lakes that they can portage to get some many, many, many boundary waters kind of things going. We just don't have it in our state. So here's put in on the first lake on Prong. This is my 21 pound, 12 foot little canoe, which was a blessing to say the least. Uh, most of these lakes had, uh, all of them have one or more campsites on them. And here's just the portage site. They all, all signed for you to go between those four little wild lakes. Aurora Lake is not too far away. Uh, maximum four foot deep. This is not something you're going to go swimming in. Uh, and it's 83 to 94 acres depending upon whether it's a drought year or it's a wet year. Right? It's going to expand or contract because it's so shallow. It's a state natural area. You see Frank Lake up there to the northwest of it. I'm going to mention Frank Lake in a minute. I just want you to keep that in mind. Look at how Frank Lake is surrounded topographically by upland, whereas Aurora Lake is completely surrounded by wetland. Here's the put-in, such as it is uh, at uh, Aurora Lake. It's a wild rice lake. It's usually end-to-end -end all wild rice. Absolutely gorgeous for birds and other wildlife. Wild rice, if you're not familiar with wild rice, the male flowers are down here. The female flowers are those little tiny flowers up there. You always have female flowers on the top of the plant and male flowers on the bottom because you don't want to self-pollinate. You want the wind-pollinated plant to blow its pollination to the side and, and 
not hit your own female flowers that are above it. So here's a close-up of those little tiny female flowers. Each one of those will become a grain of rice. Here's one of the views on Aurora Lake. If it isn't wild rice, it's pond lilies or a host of other aquatic plants. I love this site because it's loaded with birds. I've never seen so many sora rails in one site. In this particular site, Mary and I paddled there once. I think we had 13 or more sora rails. It was crazy, full of sora rails. Every bird on the planet likes wild rice, so come September, these are great places to go bird watch. Frank Lake that I mentioned just to the north of Aurora. Aurora's down here. Here's Frank Lake. Super clear, 70% sand, 38 feet deep. There's two lakes right next to each other, very, very, very different. Um, here's my, our youngest daughter, Callie, paddling with me out on this quintessential wild northern lake. Pines all around the exterior, all upland, super clear. Little island in the middle for you to stop and have lunch. It's a great lake. Loon pairs, of course. Most of these lakes did have loon pairs on them. Brings us to Bayfield County. Let's look at Totogatik Lake. This is our biggest lake in the state that's wild, 538 acres. Uh, it is also extremely shallow. I don't know if I mentioned it. I don't. I don't have the, the depth. I think it's a maximum depth of six feet. This is a huge, almost a mile square lake uh, that is just a shallow fly, frying pan, and it's end-to-end -end wild rice the best wild rice lake in the whole state. That's our put in late in the fall or late September after the rice has been harvested and the colors were just magnificent around the shoreline. And just all these, all the waterfowl that loves wild rice, wood ducks and ringnecks and, and uh, uh, green winged teals and so forth, just loaded in a place like this along with semi-aquatic mammals like otters and beavers and muskrats, mink. Just an ideal place for all that wildlife. So coming to the end here, one of the purposes of the book was to try to uh, excite people to again uh, work with local government, with local DNRs and, and Forest Service people to reestablish the Wild Lakes program. Some of you may remember that we, in 1993 there was a Northern Initiative survey. Anybody remember this out of curiosity? Anybody remember what's happening? All of us who lived up north were mailed a questionnaire from the DNR asking us what we wanted to see the north become. And the bottom line was everyone said, keep the north the north, whatever that meant to them. Keep the north the north. So people wanted land use development compatible with protecting northern Wisconsin lakes. That was the biggest thing everyone said, protect our lakes. The problem was 80% or more of those lakes are in private ownership. There's every reason to believe that by the middle of the century, every single one of those lakes that has private land will be as developed as they can possibly be. So the state came up with a four-tier approach to safeguarding these lands, these, uh, these lakes. And one of the, uh, of the four tiers was to buy, to try to buy some of the last wild lakes. And they did buy a few of them. 2006, the Trust for Public Land and the US Forest Service combined together to purchase Cantook Lake and Steelhead Lake, and I'm forgetting the name of that lake up to the top, but those three lakes and 11,700 feet of undeveloped shoreline, uh, and remove those three houses that you see on, four houses on Cantook Lake there, those are now removed. So now this is a wild area. Unfortunately, the, the uh, Wild Lakes program was dissolved in the, oh gosh, 2008 or so in that ballpark. It only had been around for about a decade. It's a political decision that we shouldn't be putting our money into more public lands. We have too much public land. End of discussion on, on wild lakes. Um, but we have a $7 billion surplus in Wisconsin, do we not? And I've wondered, wouldn't that be a wonderful thing to say to our, I hate, I'm not trying to be political. I'm just talking about lakes. Wouldn't it be great, though, if some of our, both parties came together and said, wouldn't it Let's buy some more of these lakes. We found a number of lakes that weren't in the book that had one owner, or maybe two at the most, who might be willing to sell voluntarily. Nobody's going to force them to do anything. Uh, and it might be a life estate thing where they live out the rest of their life and then they donate or sell the lake to, to the DNR or to the Forest Service. Why not use some of that money? Because these, nobody's making any more wild lakes. You know? uh, it would be a great way, I think. And I'm terribly biased. <laughs> To use, our, to use some of our surplus money. 
The book is uh, loaded with illustrations by Becca Jabs, who lives up in Manitowoc. A young woman in her mid-30s who does beautiful uh, color illustrations. It was a homegrown book. Uh, the layout design was by Bev Watkins in Green Bay, and good friend Bob Kovar up in Mattress Waters did the cover, and Christine Seidel did the proofreading. Anyway, it was a Wisconsin book. I like that fact. There's some more of the illustrations that Becca Jabs did in the book. So if you're trying to learn some of the dragonflies or some of the aquatic plants, this book will help you learn some of them. And they're just beautiful, beautiful illustrations. Last but not least, uh, should I publish a book on the last wild lakes or keep them secret? I've had a number of people literally angry with me for publishing this book. My response is no one ever washed a rental car. Has anyone here ever washed a rental car? Yeah, I knew it. <laughs> Three people are raising their hand. Why did you wash your rental car? You'd been out mudding around in it, right? And the only reason you did it is so you'd get all your money back. Is that correct? Correct me if I'm wrong. Did you do it out of a moral or ethical obligation to the rental car company? I'm German. What's that? I'm German. You're German. <laughs> well, that's an interesting excuse. Um, well, so, oh, I won't even go there. Um, but the point being, Ownership is not necessarily as a legal title sense, but ownership is a heartfelt place. Do you feel ownership for the place and where you live? Right. And so it's a commitment. It's a marriage to a place. And that's what I was trying to help foster through this book was to get people to more deeply fall into love and ultimately marry some of these places. Because there's going to be pressure into the future to sell off our public lands. As more and more of us live here, more and more pressure for a, a greater tax base to, you know, to, for schools and roads and all the things that we all need. And if no one is there to say, no, you, you know, here's this lake, Totogatik Lake, it's the best wild rice lake. You can't be selling the homes all along there. You can't be doing that. If no one's, no one's fallen in love with these places, there'll be nobody to fight for them, to protect them. Because really, they're just rare as all get out. If I could only find a hundred and... 38 or so lakes over 30 acres that are still wild left in the entire state. That's not very many. They're really rare. And most of them are really small. And most of them are silty and muck lakes and wild rice lakes and places no one wanted to water ski or do any of those recreational things on. So the point being, I published it knowing full well this will bring more people to those places. And you lose some of the wild values by more people coming. On the other hand, more people will fall in love, hopefully, and fight to protect them. Finish with this quote by Edward Abbey. I love Edward Abbey. Wilderness is not a luxury, but a necessity of the human spirit, and is vital to our lives as water and good bread. A civilization which destroys what little remains of the wild, the spare, the original, is cutting itself off from its origins and betraying the principle of civilization itself. <coughs> The last quote is just Peter Steinhardt. What we see in lakes depends on what we bring to the shore. King Arthur's sword or the Loch Ness Monster. Right? <laughs> I wanted to add one last thing before, and before we do this, which is uh, shameless self-promotion, but it's really not. My wife is a, a, a master weaver, and she's just uh, uh, opened up an exhibit up in Ashland called Woman and Water, Woven Portraits of Women from Around the World all of whom are working to protect water, conserve water, doing these amazing things, just astonishing stories of these women um, who are fighting to be advocates for water uh, wherever they live, from India to uh, Peru to New Zealand, all around the world, 20 different countries are in this exhibit. We've got some information up here. We actually just published a book last week on all these women and on the exhibit. Um, I would just encourage you to consider going up to Ashland at some point see this, it'll be there until mid-October at the Northern Great Lakes Visitor Center. And after that, it's going to the Watros Gallery in Madison, the uh, uh, Wisconsin Academy's gallery for two months in November, December, and into January. So I think I've got that right. Late November to the beginning of February. Late November to the beginning of February. Anyway, it's all about, all, my encouragement for everyone is to conserve, protect water, and this exhibit is Mary started this at the same time I started writing this book. She did a different way of coming at it, and it's worth, <coughs> worth seeing. I'll shut up now. Thank you. <laughs> no, thank you.